What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another Pit Mailbag here on the Post Gazette Sports Now YouTube channel and podcast network. He is Chris Carter. I am Noah Hiles. Carter, no way to sugarcoat it. This is about as bad as it gets. If you're the Pit Football Program, Pit fell to four or one and four. Excuse me. It wishes it fell to four and one. Uh, it fell to one and four Saturday evening in Blacksburg, Virginia, as it lost a, a not very good Virginia Tech team. Uh, 0-2 in the ACC. The bye week has arrived, so no Monday afternoon press conference for Pat Narduzzi, which I'm sure he's very happy about because there are there are a lot of questions to be answered about this team, and I don't think he has a lot of answers to those questions. It's It's just probably the darkest it's ever been since he arrived here. I think that's very easy to say right now. One and four, uh, nothing seems to be working on either side of the ball. The defense is getting is getting run through, uh, not just giving up big plays in the past game. That's the thing is that whatever a Pat Narduzzi defense you know was, even if it's roughest times, may give up big plays in the past game, but you are not going to run the ball on it at will, and that seems to be happening uh, in, in, in this part of the season. And the offense, where they at least would dominate the line of scrimmage, they haven't done that either. And I, I wrote about that in my film study just about how badly this offensive line has been specifically. And uh, it, it's just it's it's stemming into the identity that Pitt football at least had going for it, that even if this was an off year, they'd win the trenches, they'd get after the quarterback, they'd run the football, and they'd have a fine, a decent season at the end of the year. And maybe they just need to reset a quarterback. But now at this point, they're looking like they need resets across the board. And that's what's super troubling. Yeah, it really is. And we've got a lot of questions to answer here in today's mailbag. But before we do, we got to talk about our presenting sponsor, which is Mike's Beer Bar. Whether if you're in town for a Steelers, Pirates, or Pit game, Mike's Beer Bar is right across the street from PNC Park. And has the best selection of beer in town as well as, as, well as an amazing uh, list of food options. They have over 20 TVs, and you can catch all of your NFL, college football, Pirates, Penguins, Riverhounds, and Premier League action right at Mike's. Come on in and try one of their 500 different available beers, 300 of them being local craft beers as well as 80 different local craft beers available on tap. You can also get a flight and try out every option you can dream of. And trust me, you won't run out of favorites because I never do and I'm always there. Try their steak on a stone for an awesome meal where you can choose how hot you want your steak cooked with a heated stone right in front of you as you enjoy a night out in Pittsburgh. Come to Mike's Beer Bar and get your sports fix and experience the best bar in Pittsburgh. All right, so shout out to Mike's. Let's get into the questions. Nate starts us off. If Narduzzi was to leave for Michigan State, what caliber coach would Pitt seek out? Is someone like Dan Mullen out of the question? This is an interesting question. Um, I'm not sure now what the Narduzzi to East Lansing rumors are looking like. Yeah. Um, you know, they were they were the talk uh, over the past weekend leading up to the game, but. At this rate, I mean, I don't know if Michigan State will tolerate hiring a, a guy who's coming off of a, what, two, three, four win season at best, which is the way it's like looking for Pitt right now. But let's assume that they're willing to look past that, and Narduzzi does go there. I, and again, he has been rumored and in the mix here, but the worse things go for Pitt, the more I, I don't know if that's going to end up happening, but let's assume Pat does leave his replacement will be interesting. Now they threw out the name, Nate threw out the name, Dan Mullen. I look at Dan Mullen and think that that's probably not an ideal fit for Pitt. And here's why Dan Mullen's a guy, I think who will look at Pitt as a stepping stone. And that's not what Pitt really wants no. to hire. They're going to want another guy like Pat Narduzzi. Who's going to come in here and be around for, seven, eight, nine, ten years if possible. And and that's very hard to find for any program at the collegiate level um, for a multitude of different reasons. But Mullen, I think, is a guy who, I mean, right now he just needs a job. And he did stay around at Mississippi State for a decent amount of time, so maybe that would be the case here at Pitt. But I just think that a guy like Mullen probably looks at Pitt as more of a stepping stone where there are other guys out there Um that you could probably go to and uh, they might have a better connection here and want to stick around longer. And I think that's what they're probably looking for. But 
out of all the names that are possibilities, like reasonable possibilities, guys who aren't like Urban Meyer or someone. Um, I mean, Mullen would probably be like one of the bigger names that Pitt could go get because, I mean, they pay well. It is a power five job, but I don't think that would probably be the guy that they want. Carter, what about you? Yeah, I, I'm not on the Mullen bandwagon. I mean, that's also a guy's last stint was with Florida, made them really competitive really quickly, but then got fired shortly afterwards uh, with them falling apart. You know, I, I think that he was able to recruit well at Florida, but, uh, you know, Florida also has a lot of assets in the SEC that I don't think are uh, readily available to Pitt in that department. So I'm not 100% sure, you know, if he'd be familiar with that. I think Pitt needs to go after uh, a younger coach, who could be looking to set up here for quite some time, some guy that might be able to, you know, kind of recharge. If, if Again, this is on a very, very, this is like we are taking three steps to get to here, but yeah. like Pat and Arduzzi and Michigan state even talking and then them choosing Pat and Arduzzi, you know, if I'm Michigan state and I'm looking at this year at Pitt, I might be looking at my and saying like, mm, I don't know. Uh, and, and trying to find someone else and maybe even find some of these people, but like, you know, guys like a Jesse Minter who's been at Michigan, Mi uh, Michigan and with their, as their defensive coordinator guys like Garrett Riley at TCU guys that I think that, you know, they've, they've had some traction as coordinators on their side of the ball. And I think especially guys like Minter, like, you know, that's a guy that's been in Michigan similarly to Pat, he'd, come, he'd be a defensive coordinator uh, from a, from a big 10 school. Um, but I, I look at guys like that and, you know, other coaches who might be in, in a similar area, you know, might, maybe not like, you know, the ACC specifically, but he's coming from Michigan. You know, uh, you're, you're coming, you're coming from the Midwest. You can move, you could, you could, you could scout that area. You can learn more about the East coast. There's connections there that, that, that you can build. But if you want, if you want a head coach, you want a younger head coach who I think can instill the same defensive principles that you have been able to maintain. I think it's the biggest thing that Pat Narduzzi has helped reestablish for Pitt, keep those defensive principles, but also be open to a, a new study, you know, a more modern style of offense that we saw for a little bit with Kenny Pickett and Mark Whipple when they really put it together in 2021. But we obviously haven't seen the last two years. Yeah, so I guess the way to conclude that is it, it's just really hard to predict what type of hire uh, Pitt will want to make because they still have a head coach right now. Um, so, and, and, yeah. and I think they're yeah. going to have a head coach for the foreseeable future at the very least. I mean, if, if these rumors pick up, then yeah, I, I, I think, but I think it's kind of weird to speculate what they'll do after Narduzzi leaves because. We don't know if he's going to leave, but I, I will say this, like, as we wrap up this thing, I mean, there's, there's a couple of things that I think should be noted. Um, Heather like in her other coaching hires has hired people that she has a little bit of familiarity with. I mean, you just look at like one of her more recent hires, the softball coach, uh, she played with her at Michigan. So mm -hmm. Chris, you know, you naming the defensive coordinator for Michigan. I mean, she's going to probably look at people who, she has good insight on. And if she still knows people in the Michigan athletic department or somewhere like that, that might be somewhere to lean on. Uh, but the other thing is, you know, Pitt pays coaches well. I mean, Narduzzi's paid well, Capel's paid well. And, and I mean, these coaches come in with solid starting salaries as well before they get extended. So I don't know. It'll be interesting. But again, I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure that Narduzzi is going to be gone, especially that's my how thing. things like, are like, looking right now. Like let's 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 stop skipping that part of this. That Pat Nard Pat Narduzzi signed through twenty thirty. And again, like we we talked about this in in the in our last mailbag episode. I'm not hundred percent sure he wants to necessarily leap. I think he he uh, Pat Narduzzi. We know of all of all his traits, good or bad. He is stubborn. He wants to prove that he can win it, win with what he's got. He's kept a lot of the same coaches for such a long time. He wants to prove that he that what he's doing here at Pitt is the right thing. I don't think he's going to leave. Like we talked about, if we're gonna pick one or the other, Heather like or him i'd pick heather like to leave because she's done so well at Pitt, and you know ohio state can offer a really big bag and give her an opportunity to do something at one of the biggest college you know college sports programs and you know at the part athletic departments in the country that's different than what pat narduzzi's in pat narduzzi is, you know he has his money locked up for quite some time he has his system this is his house i think he'll want to defend it and if they even if they struggle to the end of this year and this is a terrible season i think he'll want to prove with pitt that this was an anomaly compared to everything else he's done yeah and he might that might be his only option too you know if he doesn't get a job offer so yeah. we'll see 
JFF asks, can you provide input on what wide receivers slash tight ends are doing in terms of routes and separation with the limited number of plays due to the inability to sustain drives? It would be great to know which wide receivers and tight ends are executing their roles well beyond the QB not being able to get them the ball. Carter, I'll let you start with this. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a lot of problems with Pitt. I, I see guy I see guys getting open. I see guys, you know, running their routes, but you can also start to see frustration seeping in when the pass game isn't working, when so many other functional parts of the offense aren't working. And that is just and that that that's a reality thing. It happens a lot with younger players too. Uh, but I, I think you see encouragement from guys like Kanate Mumfield who are making diving catches in ridiculous situations, even when the game is already getting out of hand. And and you could say like, you know what, I, this this game went on me. But you see them fighting to the end there. I, I know I think that there's there's things that everyone can clean up, but I don't think this is the biggest problem. And I actually wrote about this for my film study. The offensive line getting its butt kicked is, is, is a major issue for Pitt. Yeah. They they are now the second to last team in run rushing offense in the ACC. That that shouldn't be happening when you're supposed to be the team that, that that's going to bully people across the ball. And, you know, it's fundamental things. And that's what my Pitt film study was, was looking at in, for, for the Post-Gazette. Find that at post-gazette.com. But, these aren't these aren't plays where you're asking guys to to do remar- have remarkable blocks or they're just getting outperformed by big mauling defensive tackles. We're talking about Blake Zabovic just missing in the interior. Him and Terrence Moore on a play where it was it was third and two and they needed just Daniel Carter to just get two yards inside zone simple simple alignment. They both him uh, Zabovic and Terrence Moore are lined up next to each other. There's a defensive tackle lined up in between them. Neither of them touch him. Moore goes one way, blocks nobody. Zabovic goes the other way, doesn't block anybody, and he and he walks through the linebacker, just comes through and blows up the play. The defensive tackle that at least could have been chipped by Depovich uh, just just comes just comes through and they they destroy the play there. Uh, there's other plays where like Ryan Bear, redshirt freshman, and he's you know he he's younger, so he's he's learning. But you're seeing him. The the biggest thing you want to see out of Ryan Bear is that you're coming out with fire. You're young. You got to prove something. You're going to hit somebody. And there are plays where he's getting beat off the ball. Like the other guys just beat is just simply quicker in his stuff. He's inside of him before Ryan Bears even taking his first step. And those are things that you can that you need to be better at as a player. You may lose on technique. You may lose on some you know some some situations that are outside of your control or just by you know, savvier veterans. But as far as getting off the ball, being first, being aggressive in that first step, that is something you must be able to do. And Dave Borbley has to get that out of his offensive line. That's where I put the emphasis of the problems on offense right now, on top of Phil Dracovic and other issues with Frank Signetti. Yeah, and to tie in kind of what you just said to this question, I I think it's hard to analyze how well routes are being ran when the play ends before the route tree can really unfold. I I mean, yeah, there's sometimes where – you look at the end of the play and Kanate Mumfield doesn't have anyone within 15 yards of him. But what happened on that play? Was Jakovic even able to look downfield at his receivers? Like, yeah. I mean, the, the defender might have just given up on the play just because he saw the quarterback's laying on his back. And then and there's other instances where, you know, you could point at Phil just looking at one side of the field the whole time. So it doesn't necessarily matter if – the guy on the backside ran his post well if that was not even in consideration for that play. And and I think that that's especially been the case in the last couple of weeks, Carter, is you could see a lot of their passing concepts that are drawing up. They're keeping it simple. They're keeping it to one side of the field where he can drop back, he can look, and he's got option one deep, option two mid-size you know, or mid-range throw, option three in the flat. And he's not looking out to the other side. He doesn't have to read in a whole side of the field because he's clearly struggling. And so is the protection. So with that all being said, they're, they're letting it just keep it simple and cutting the field in half for him. But even with that, because the protection has been so bad, because the quarterback himself has been so bad, there's just no way to really look at how well guys are running their routes just because no one else is executing. So I would say, yeah, Gavin Bartholomew has been fine just based off of his production. And the fact that he pretty much catches the ball every time he's targeted, which you can't really say about anyone else on the team. Kanate Mumfield, I think, is just proven to be a really good route runner, not just based on this year, but last year as well. And the times where he does make plays, he's wide open. And that's a product of the route running. But uh, between poor execution on the offensive line, poor execution from the quarterback, and I'll even throw this in there, poor play calling. Um, it's really hard to evaluate 
the receivers and tight ends as far as route running goes. There's been clear miscommunication there, I think. I mean, you could obviously point to means and and Dracovic not being on the same page, but overall, it's it's everything else has been so bad, it's really hard to to look at them as a group right now. Um, so yeah, we'll move forward. Nicholas wants to know. Uh, Nicholas says he's read that Pitt may be moving its previously scheduled 2027 game against Wisconsin to Ireland. He's curious what is about the financial comparison of giving up a home game, lost gate revenues, concessions, etc., versus a marquee Week Zero road game matchup in Ireland. Is Pitt giving up uh, revenue, or is is Pitt giving up revenue for exposure, or is there enough? of an additional in incentive kicked in by the networks to cover any lost home game revenues. Uh, sorry, I had to read it like that. This is a long question and it doesn't show in the general abbreviation there. Um, and it continues, I'm operating under the assumption that the home game versus Wisconsin will be a sellout or close to it. Okay, so... Uh, I, we both did a little digging into this, uh, Carter. I, I'm going I'm to start by basically explaining what I've learned here. Um, multiple articles that I've read showed that when two teams go to Ireland, they're compensated. Yeah. And it's not necessarily by the network. It's it's by Ireland. It's mm -hmm. the, the, the country pays to have these two teams come over and compete, and that's through sponsorships that they sell – for that game, that's through a whole bunch. Of, that's their efforts. They pay those two teams to co come over and compete. They pay for their travel. And the home team, the team that would have the home game, gets the bigger end of that compensation. So in this case, in 2027, Pitt is supposed to be home against Wisconsin. So Pitt mm -hmm. would get the bigger payout than Wisconsin. And that payout is supposed to uh, equate to a number similar to what they would have in an average home game. Now... As Nick pointed out, this game would probably be something a little bit more than an average home game for Pitt. You would you would figure yeah. that the tickets would sell well for Wisconsin coming to Pittsburgh. Now, with that being said, from what I've read, when they have these games, and this past year was an anomaly because Notre Dame was the home team against Navy this year. But in past years, when Ireland does this, they like for the smaller brand of the two – to be the home game because that means they can pay that. Like if last year was Nebraska versus Northwestern, they wanted Northwestern to be the home team because Northwestern makes probably right. a third of what Nebraska does during its home football games. Right. That's probably similar to what Pitt and Wisconsin compare to where Wisconsin, you're packing that camp Randall stadium out for every game or close to it. And uh, especially for a matchup, you know, against an ACC opponent like Pitt. Where Pitt, yeah, you know, they, they'd probably sell, I would say, around 50,000 tickets. That's, I think, a close number to where they were last year against Tennessee. Um, I don't think this would be a sellout, but it would be a very sizable crowd. But Pitt would probably be the more affordable option of the two. I'm guessing Pitt would probably get something close to what it would be projected to make for that Wisconsin home game in 2027. But at the end of the day, I think this is still a win for Pitt where you're making what you would make if you had a home game. Um, there's not like a, a distinct home field advantage that Pitt has, if we're being honest with each other. Even in the year that it won the ACC championship, both of its losses came at home. It yeah. performed better on the road. So it's not like you're losing out on an amazing home atmosphere that you can depend on week in and week out. Um, so you get that money, and you get some big-time national exposure. If this game's played in week zero – that's the game everyone's watching. It's the first game that everyone's watching in the college football season. Um, so, yeah, I, I would consider it a win for Pitt. I don't know if it's a win for Wisconsin, if Wisconsin's the home team. But if Pitt's the home team and it gets the bigger chunk uh, payout here and it gets a bye week the following week, I, I based off of everything that I've read, I would say that Pitt probably makes out well in this situation. And, you know, it also depends on where they are. This game's what, 2027? Mm -hmm. So – where is Pitt in 2027? Is Pat Narduzzi still still here? Like, like yeah. you know, we were just talking about that topic there. Is Pitt really competitive in 2027? If if Pitt is a really good team in 2027, like let's say that, you know, Julian Duggard is 
the superstar quarterback. I'm not saying that he will be, but I'm yeah. saying let's say that he he's the guy that they that, that they have coming from Penn Hills. He becomes in. Let's say he's the next Kenny Pickett. This is the year that he's going to take off and destroy everyone's souls. Want that. At, at Acrisure Stadium because you'd want that there, right? But at the same token, because you want you'd want to get the same kind of excitement that, to, that that you get when your team's really good and you're at a home home atmosphere. But like you like you brought up, if you have that game, you know, internationally, it's the first game of the season. Everyone's everyone's looking at it, everyone's paying attention to it. Then it kind of puts that spot on spotlight on you. And you if you perform well in that instance, you're gonna you're gonna start with a really good spark to the year. So there's good and bads to it. At the end of the day, like you said, if Ireland's compensation is matching or exceeding what you're getting as far as you know money or the revenue you get from having a home crowd as a senior season opener against a major big 10 opponent then then you know go you know go, go for it it's a unique experience something that you can that you can build off of and move forward with but it's just another one of those things that's way too down the line before i, I think we can see how this will actually impact pit um general generally i think that most teams don't want to give up home games you know even though pit doesn't have a distinct home field advantage because they don't have you know the kind of home crowds that you see like with like with virginia tech and west virginia where they're the only ticket in town and that's what's going to drive them there it's still an advantage in the sense to have it on your home turf in the stadium that you're familiar with and in your in in your home situation so it's something to consider moving forward but it's one of those things that you know business people are going to make that decision ahead of your team uh or above your team and you're going to you and pat narduzzi and their team they're going to just deal with the decision as it comes i, I think Go for it if you think it's it's going to be great. But I, to me, either way, I, I don't feel too torn yeah, that Pitt has made a poor decision in either either direction with it. I think one other thing to consider, and you know, this is first off, this is going to be a decision that's made years before this game is played. It probably it could be yeah. a decision that's made this this fall. Um, but one thing you also need to consider is in 2027, this team might be taking a trip to the West Coast already. So yeah. what what's what's this international trip adding? So I, I think that should be another caveat is that hey, you know, I I, I believe Philip said when these two teams on the West Coast are added, Stanford and and, and Cal, uh, that Pitt would be making one trip to the West Coast every two seasons. So if they're gonna do this, they need to make sure that they're also not gonna be playing a road game at Stanford or Cal, or ideally even at SMU this this season because adding an international trip to a trip plus a trip three time zones away in the middle of the regular season, that's a conference game. Now you're stacking on a lot of flight miles and it's, it's becoming a little more convoluted than I think it needs to be. So that's something also to consider. Um, and yeah, it, it's, it's an interesting topic to begin with. I personally would not be opposed to heading to Ireland to cover a football game. Hmm. Um, we'll move on now. Terry wants to know of the three main guys in Pitt's quarterback room. Only Nate Yarnell has shown any competence as a power five QB, albeit in limited duty. So why doesn't he get to sniff the field? All right. I want to start with this one, Carter. I apologize. Go ahead. Nate Yarnell played one game against Western Michigan. And I think he threw 15 passes in that game. And well, yeah, he, he did fine. He did fine in that game. He was efficient. He was accurate. He did not make mistakes. And it could be argued that if he play, if a quarterback played like that for Pitt this season in each of its five games, Pitt would probably have a record better than one and four. There's no he doubt about it. He threw 12 that. passes. <laughs> yeah, he threw 12 passes. What, he was 9 of 12? 9 of 12. For what, 114 yards, something like that? 100, 179 with a touchdown. 179 and a touchdown. Okay, so better yardage nonetheless. The, but the 12 passes, that's I just pointed 12 out. passes that's, against Western <laughs> Michigan, and he also had a guy in the backfield named Israel Banacanda. He had a better offensive line. He had a better receiving group. And again, they're playing Western Michigan. Let's, you know, the, Terry pointed out, you know, he said that of the three main guys in Pitt's quarterback room, only Nate Yarnell has shown any competence as a power five quarterback. That's not true. Uh, Christian Bayer also played one game in his collegiate career. Uh, in a spot similar to Yarnell, where I think, I don't know if they started or if he came in early in the game due to an injury, but he looked better against Rutgers in his one game at Penn State than Yarnell did against Western Michigan. So if that's the sample size there, and I get it, Bayer hasn't looked great in his limited duties at Pitt as a backup, but if we're going by past resumes, Bayer's is better than Yarnell, plain and simple. 
Also, Phil Dracovic has had success at the Power 5 level. Granted, it was one season out of five, but again, he has shown some form of competence. Otherwise, Pitt wouldn't have taken him. He had a great year in 2020, if you look at the numbers. And he was especially great against Pitt. So all three of these guys have shown some form of competence as a Power 5 quarterback, and the guy who showed the most competence is the guy who's starting right now. Am I advocating for Phil Dracovic to continue starting? No, I'm not. He's been bad this year. I don't know if he's the best option on the roster or not, as of, based off of you know everything we've seen. Maybe he is right now, but it still might be time to make a change. But this is the guy who has the best pass resume out of the three. So and I get that Yarnell, Yarnell won a football game. I get it. And I, I wouldn't be opposed to seeing Nate Yarnell come in and get his opportunity uh, if they're going to continue giving opportunities to younger guys like they have at other positions. But let's not sit here and act like Nate Yarnell is this Heisman in waiting uh, on the depth chart. And and who's to say that I, I don't get why there's more love for him than Vayer just because, I mean, granted, Vayer did not play well against North Carolina in the second half. Um, I think both should be looked at equally as they both had one good game in their past. They're both young and they're both competing to be that number two, to be that guy next year. I think if you're going to give opportunities to younger quarterbacks for the rest of the year, they both should get an equal look. But Yarnell, to make the argument that Yarnell is the only one who showed competence as a power five quarterback is ridiculous in my opinion. Listen. Pat Narduzzi says a lot of things that, that ticks off a lot of Pitt fans when they lose and when the Pitt, when Pitt loses and, and things are falling apart. But one point that I think that he has uh, has it on is that you can't just dilly-dally just going through and just picking up, uh, just starting whichever quarterback, whichever week, because then you start chaos. And whereas I've been on the train like, hey, when Phil Jacoby doesn't have it, you should give someone else another chance. Like in the middle of the West Virginia game, I thought that was an instance Phil Jacoby should have been replaced. Um, and just said, not even permanently, but Phil, you know, you're, you're missing very obvious things right now. We're going to give another guy a shot just to see if he can, if he can bounce back. We're going to come back to you, you know, most likely at some point this season, maybe even next week, if this doesn't work, but you don't want to get into the situation where you're just guessing on quarterback every single week, because then when you do, and you, you miss on, you miss on one, because another thing, like we, we saw Kenny Pickett have bad games for Pitt. And if you bailed on him after a bad game to find another guy, then you ruin his confidence in in himself being being the guy for you moving forward. You don't allow him to bounce back from the mistakes in the next game, and you stunt you stunt his growth. Beyond Nate Yarnell's, you know, potential as Christian Christian Veyers, I, I think that it makes sense to remind people that if if Pitt fans had their way, you'd have seen Ty Diefenbach by now. You you've gone you'd go you've gone through all four quarterbacks. Yeah. You've seen, you, you mean, Eli Kasanovich could have, you know, come off from being a coach on the team and, and, and being played. Like, give him a shot. And that is where things get unreasonable. And that's where head coaches have to ha kind of hold the line. And, and that's why I give Pat Narduzzi credit. He does not bow to, you know, fan wishes as far as what he hope what, what people want to see. He's he's going to st be steadfast. And sometimes there's that level between stubborn and persistent, right? You know, stubborn is when you, you know, when, when you're, when you've gone over that line, you know, persistent is when you know, you, you know, you have a belief in that a system that works, you stick to it, even when, even when there's certain, there's other things getting in your way. But the trick is knowing where that line exists. Few people do the best coaches do. And I think that's where Pat Narduzzi is trying to find. And listen, not saying that Phil Dracovic is, is is the guy lying in wait that eventually if they stick with him, he's going to be the guy. But if you take Phil Dracovic out, you do what you did with Veyer when, when Phil Dracovic was hurt and he's terrible, then you throw in Nate Yarna and he's terrible. Then you go back to Phil Dracovic, then you've told the whole team you don't believe in any of these guys. Right. And then there's no, there's no, there's no focus, there's no point of leadership. It's just we're throwing anyone out there, and that's how teams start to fall apart fast. And, and listen, Pitt's falling apart right now. Like they, they're one and four. There's got to be a lot of questions in the locker room about what's going on. And that to me is, is part of the problem. But if you start cycling through quarterbacks, you speed up that process so much faster. Yeah, I, and I think the only way to do it, as we round up uh, that the answer to that question, is I think that it might come to a certain point this season where you have to start looking at 2024. I don't think we're drastically far from that, honestly. 
Um, yeah. And if you're going to do that, I think you got to be open and honest and say that, look, we need to evaluate both of these guys. I, I, I don't see a reason why Yarnell should not get similar opportunity to Vayer, uh, but, but vice versa, neither of those guys have done anything to deserve a spot over Phil, aside from the fact that Phil himself has been bad. So if you're going to give one a shot, give both a shot, but make it clear that, hey, for the remainder of the year, we're going to be doing a two quarterback system and it's going to be these two guys. And we're going to try to find our starting quarterback last year. They did it with, you know, other positions last season and they're doing it with other positions this season. But what you don't want is to have a mess like they had at punter last year at quarterback where they're just going every series. It's a different guy. Is it this guy? Is it that guy or whatever? Um, so, yeah, I, I think there's a way to go about it. But I also think that you need to figure out other positions before you really commit to finding your quarterback of 2024. Because like Pat said, at the end of Saturday's game, do you, do you really want to throw out someone else in there when the offensive line's playing this bad? I think he said Dan Marino couldn't even do well with that type of blocking. I would probably disagree with that. I think Marino probably would find a way to complete more than five he, and 15 he, attempts, but he, he, nonetheless. He'd make, he'd make a way, yeah. Yeah, but I get what he's saying. Two more questions here. This one comes from the ghost of Pitt script. What are the chances Pitt has its worst season since 1998? In 1998, it went 2-9 and overall, 0-7 and in the Big East. Did they win another game? I don't know. Uh, Carter, you can start. Um, that's a good question. I, I don't know the way if they, uh, I said this at, you know, in the, you know, in the third quarter, when, when that game started getting out of hand against Virginia tech, if they play that way, like they did against Virginia tech and like they have the last several, the last, I'd say three out of the last four games, ah, no two out of the last three. I like, I think Cincinnati, they at least fought back and that effort might win you some games. West Virginia was abysmal. This game was abysmal. If you play like that for the rest of the season, you're toast. Yes, th- you might win one game against – it might just be Wofford. But I do think that this team still has talent on it. I still think they can rebound. This is this bye week is coming at an important time. What's going to tell a lot is how they come out firing against Louisville. They need – Louisville has potential on their on their team. I'm not sure – I'm not picking them yeah. to beat Louisville. But if you can come out and at least show fire and, and make that a competitive game and show growth from from the from before the bye week, that will say a lot to me. And I'm like, okay, maybe you can bang with Wake Forest or Boston College, and you can get, you can sneak a couple wins in there. Maybe something can be built in this season. But right now, you're right. This is getting close to being about 2024, and everyone's going to look at that about the quarterback. But I look at this about the trenches. You got to see these young guys. Who's going to step the heck up and punch somebody in the mouth? And that's where that's where Pitt needs to be at least able to do. I, you know, like we're talking about. I'm not so sure the the future, the next future Pitt super quarterback that's going to make their passing game super relevant. You know, as a national conversation again is on this roster right now, and maybe it is. But I know that that what they what they have is a lot of highly recruited guys that they've added to both sides of the ball, and they need those guys to be able to step up as well as other playmakers at corner and wide receiver. They need guys to develop. And that's what this, this this process needs needs to be about. I think that that if they're able to show that against Louisville, they'll be fine. They'll maybe get four, five, maybe six wins if they if they go on a crazy tear. But it, the each week we've been saying we're waiting for the bounce back. It hasn't happened yet. We have to see some sign of life against Louisville, or it will be 1998 all over again. I don't know if you can pick this pit team to win another game right now. As right as, now, as no. the way things currently stand. I have no reason to, if I was like an odds maker, I'd make Pitt an underdog in every one of its remaining games, including the Thursday night home game against Boston College. I just, there's, there, this, this team goes against everything that we've typically known about a Pat Narduzzi era Panther team. It's, it's not tough. And I, I people are going to be pissed with me saying that, but it's, it's not, it's not a tough football team. It gets bullied in the trenches, like Carter has pointed out. It's not deep. Um, it can't stop the run and it can't run the football. So with that being said, you know, in past years, I would look at them being in a tough hole and you would say, you know what, they're going to figure it out. These games, these big games, these are games that Pitt shows up. Pitt always plays tough on the road at Notre Dame. Pitt always dominates Syracuse. You could, you could go to those past cliches. Pitt's going to be able to, you know, play well in November, like it did last year where it went four and oh, and, and, you know, sparked a five and oh finish. But this team looks to be an anomaly in the Pat Narduzzi era because it, it does not have any sort of identity that a past 
Pat Narduzzi team had, where, like I said, it's tough in the trenches. It stops the run. It's able to run the football. And another thing that was able to pull Pitt out of its most notable holes throughout the Pat Narduzzi area era was a guy named Kenny Pickett, who, you know, when times were tough, when it lost 51 to six at home to Penn state, when it, uh, fell to four and when it lost four in a row during the pandemic season, when it was four and seven heading into a home game against Miami, who was number two in the country to end the year. I mean, Kenny Pickett was a guy who fixed a lot of problems and he's not around and all the other areas that I mentioned are not performing well. So based off of that, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to pick them to win another game. I don't think they'll finish one and 11. I think you'd have to assume that something is going to turn around for Pitt, but right now it's, it's, it's hard to predict what area that's going to happen in. I don't know if it's going to be a quarterback stepping up, offensive line stepping up, running backs just taking completely over. Uh, something might happen, but right now I'm, I, I'm not, I'm done playing the look ahead schedule game because right now, if you ask me, I think they're they're up against it against every single opponent until something else looks different. So we'll, we'll go now to our final question. This comes from CC Pitt under Narduzzi is he said in his uh, question that he submitted to us that Pitt was 14 and 15. I actually looked it up. I believe they're 14 and 14 in night games in Pat Narduzzi's era. Um, this number skews, obviously, as the numbers are a bit more uh, negative this year. Uh, but is there anything to Narduzzi and his coaching support staff being unable to get this team properly ready for night games? All right, so t- let's take a look at this again. I, he said 14 and 15. I found that based off my research, 14 and 14 is what uh, pit teams are in the Pat Narduzzi era in games that started at 6.30 p.m. or later. All right, so yeah, they're 14 and 14 this year, or overall in night games, but they're 0 and 4 in night games this season. So heading into the 2023 season, Pat and Arduzzi's teams were 14 and 10 in night games. That's good for a 583 win percentage. That's not far off from his overall win percentage at Pitt, which is 601, or it was 601 heading into this season. So no, I I don't think there's a correlation. I think overall, his teams won close to 60% of their night games in his tenure, and his teams entering this season won around 60% of their overall games. Yeah. Now this year they're bad in night games, but this year they're bad in every game. I mean, they're, they're losing to a lot of opponents and uh, yeah, they all happen to be at night, but I don't, I don't know if you move that contest to noon that Pitt's going to come out and be able to block Cincinnati's defensive line. I don't know if you move that game. I mean, I think enter Sandman might be worth a point or two, but as far as, you know, crowd rip, uh, crowd influence or whatever, but I, I don't know that that's going to change a ton. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. I, I just don't see the night game element playing that big of a factor here. I, I, I look at stuff like that and I think, man, we, we could be kicking things around and, and making up a lot of stuff that, that, that doesn't ultimately matter. I, I think they're what they're six and four, I think in night games, the last two years, you know, well, excluding this year, of course, leading lead, leading out of that. Yeah, um, I was gonna say they're they're yeah, definitely more yeah. than four because they've lost four mm-hmm. night games this year. No, yeah, but I'm talking yeah. about in 2022 and 2021. There's, I think they were six and four in their night games combined there, and I think ultimately it comes down to circumstances. Like I don't think it's a it's a night game issue. I think that this this is a team that's struggling at certain issues of its game. That's where I think that people start to look for other things when they don't know what to look for when things are going bad and they start looking for things it's it's kind of like what mike tom was talking about when he when he brought up mojo he he just brought that up as a word but he's like we don't believe you don't believe in like like you know superstition or things like that or you know like like i don't think those things are factors in what's going on Pitt is not playing well because they're because they're not executing in the right spots they're they're unprepared in certain situations pat narduzzi has to do a better better job preparing his team to respond to different points of adversity in the teams that they're facing in front of them i don't think night games have a problem they looked pretty good when they beat west virginia last year it, it, uh, under the under the lights uh you know at Ac- accuracy stadium they've looked pretty good in you know uh, other games that they've played in 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 night games uh including at miami where they 
blew the doors off the Hurricanes the on the road. The ACC championship. The ACC championship. They were yeah. they they were bright. They played performed very bright there. Um, you know, the week before that against Syracuse. Like I, again, I just I think we can make up a lot of different things and start going in all these different narratives when teams lose as people like to do. But the bottom line is you got to stick to what they're doing on the field, study that, apply that, look at how that compares to their stats and and, and trends that you see there. Those are the things that you need to look at when, when pitch struggles, not necessarily just their record at a certain time of day. And especially with this, where I don't think it correlates to anything that shows a, a big stat point. And maybe we're way off. You know what? Maybe, maybe pit, like they practice early in the morning. Maybe they're just better at playing at noon. I don't know. Um, one thing is for certain though. I mean, there have been a lot more night games recently last year. There was the most night games in the Pat and Arduzzi era six. Um, there's going to be at least six this year as we've already played four. Louisville's a six 30 kickoff and Boston college, I believe is an 8 PM kickoff. Uh, so that's, there's at least six there. Um, so, you know, but I'll over, I don't know. I don't know if the night games are, you can point the finger at a lot of things right now for Pitt, but 8 p.m. kicks, uh, I mean, they piss everyone off equally, but they don't really contribute to the win-loss record, I think. So that would be my take on it here too, Carter. Any final thoughts as we wrap up? Just that I think that Pitt, Pitt football has so much more to clean up than just, you know, the typical things. I know people want, Frank Signetti fired and, and things like that. People have talked about that and the, the offense is so bad. I'm not so sure that that just that, that magically solves anything, but Pat Narduzzi, like you said, he needs to reevaluate a lot of different things and you need to be able to establish something on offense, something on defense. And I'm seeing guys not even coming off the ball, uh, you know, at, at really, really well. Pat Narduzzi has, has talked about, you know, getting back to the basics at different times. I think that's what Pitt has to do. They need to, they, they need to throw everything else out. When you're not doing the basic things the right way, you need to get back to making sure that, that that's what this, this, uh, this, this bye week needs to be about. They need to be all about, hey, offensive line, you cannot be beat off the first step. You cannot be getting punched in the mouth like this. Defensive line, you better push them backwards. You were, you, you, you've been recruited. You guys know, we know you guys have the talent. You better execute in these situations and finish plays. They they start doing that we can start getting to the bigger superficial questions as far as different schemes and bigger things but if you can't do those basic things you're not going to win a football game especially with the way how this team is built it's bad there's just no other way to put it it's bad but we're going to keep talking about it week in and week out here on the post gazette sports now youtube channel podcast network he's chris carter i'm noah hiles hit that subscribe button if you haven't already and keep tuning in we'll have more pit coverage. We'll have more Pittsburgh sports coverage on the Post-Gazette Sports Now YouTube channel and podcast network. Take care. Thank you for checking out this content from Post-Gazette Sports. If you enjoyed the video, please like it and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Check out our Apple podcast channel for more podcast content. Click below for a special deal of 99 cents for a three-month subscription to the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette.